Hello, everyone, and welcome to Poetry Square, um, put on monthly by Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture in uh, Yuba and Sutter counties in California. And I'm Diane Funston. I'm Yuba Sutter um, poet in residence for the year. And uh, every month I bring you three poets, try to get them from different places, doesn't always work, but this time we have a variety. We have um, one in Boston and we have one in Washington state and we have one in uh, Palm Desert. So there's a little uh, flavor there of different regions. And uh, I'm gonna open like I usually do and just share a little poetry and get to know each other. And again, I thank Yuba Sutter um, Arts and Culture. I thank them for the opportunity for the show and uh, for supporting art in general, uh, which is difficult to do in these times when we're not meeting live. And uh, we're doing wonderful things though online and hope to be live soon, as soon as we can. So um, I've just moved back into my house that was rebuilt after a fire last year. And so I kind of wish that I was like the cartoon character, Elastic Woman from The Incredibles. And what I'm doing is uh, I'll read this first poem and it's, it's called Elastic Woman Stretched Too Far. I am so out of shape. Once nimble and quick, my arms outstretched to carry the world, my legs strong and sinewed to travel anywhere, my face ready to butt in everywhere. Then, as sudden as being fired, my powers disappeared. I can no longer catch those I love from falling. They must learn on their own. No more lending a hand to prevent accidents. Others must use caution, be alert, look both ways. Although I'm I tired of always lifting people up, I did it day after day without complaint. Now it's on their own merit they stand, or not. Always pulling snobs and bullies off their high horses to level ground. Constant padding of backs ad nauseum, catching what others spill and drop without care. No more. Let them tend to themselves. Grow up, fess up. I'm so fed up and having to mop up the messes. Then, too, I cannot collect the balloons that escape the child's hand or wipe the tears of those far away. Loss must be learned to appreciate. Gratitude often grows from overcoming pain. Maybe losing my powers lets me learn too. I have a life of my own to live. Just stretched a little bit too far and seeing too many boxes and unpacking lately, I think. Um, this one is, is called Bifocals. And um, Bifocals. I will soon have bifocals. Doctor says there's a difference in my reading vision and the way I view the rest of the world. He asked if I spent much time reading. Yes, doctor, a disproportional amount. And close work like writing, he inquired. Yes, sir, enough to bias my vision. I offered that I frequently squint to bring those things from far away much nearer. And my surprise when things up close aren't what I thought they were from a distance. Bifocals will help you focus, he said. Integrate your vision so there is less dissonance. Your clarity will change when you look at a page to read or write. It always has, I mused to myself. Then choosing lenses rose-colored on top and starkly clear on the bottom, I paid my bill and went home. Sometimes things really aren't exactly what they seem, um, whether they're too close or whether they're farther away. 
Um, this poem is called A Blustery Wednesday. And it, again, when uh, my family and I lived in Tehachapi, California, up in the mountains, there was a Wednesday open mic and it was by the railroad tracks and you could hear the trains going by and rattling the buildings. And this is called a blustery Wednesday. A blustery Wednesday, the wind roared all night, all day, lonelier than freight trains, twice as fast as fickle men, howling like women left behind. We write down lines, parallel as railroad tracks, crossing only at intersections, preventing a derailment or other disaster you never see coming until it happens. And you are thrown again to the other side of the tracks, opposite side of the mountain, down in the valley below. You may land at the cafe again, listening past the wind to words and music, a Wednesday open mic night. You may hear words that soothe the wind or a slow hand 12 string that melts your heart. Warmed by kind eyes and familiar faces, feeling so much better while the wind sings along and the railroad backs poetry. It, uh, something to look forward to when we can all get together um, live and back to patting people on the back and hugs and handshaking and just hearing applause and giving applause, especially for, for artists who are performing. And uh, one of our, our poets tonight comes from uh, the desert and she enjoys the desert, loves the desert. And I lived in the desert, both the high desert um, in Tehachapi and for three years in um, Nevada. And some of these poems are desert poems from Nevada. And this one is called High Desert Love Songs. I hear the desert singing, sometimes a torch song, sometimes a lullaby in restless night. Mountains, sentinels of stone, lined up surrounding our lives, waiting as we repeat our own history. The sun bakes all ambition out of the longest days. Darkness falls between the cracks. For you, a torch song through the valley, waiting to bring you young again into my open range heart. For me, a lullaby whispering caution, tucking my heart securely under cover, rocking me endlessly safe. I hear the desert singing, sometimes a lonely ballad, sometimes a final dirge. For you, the joyous revelry, promise of brilliant sunshine, a place for basking after shed skin. For me, run on verses of backbeat, lost in the lyrics of yesterday, sung in a duly different arrangement. And uh, this other one is called Desert Landscape. Morning, sip coffee, drink stone, far as ground meets horizon. Mountains, eroded warriors, brown bastions guard all who settle here. Movement, gangly tree limbs wave surrender after gusting wind overtakes them. Midnight, sentinel stars map dark sky, ancient cartography for all who are lost. And uh, one of the places we used to go uh, when we lived um, down south was uh, Death Valley. And one of my favorite places in Death Valley was um, Artist Drive. And this is about the, the color of that. Death Valley Artist Drive. God breathed motion into rock, desert ridges, the painted palette, 
His artist eye sees from the distance a spattering of mineral colors, green, orange, gold kaleidoscope, alive, moving in unyielding wind. The never hidden sun stares onto mosaic design, blind with starkness, alone in unforgiving land. This abstraction, this unexpected boldness, a statement so an ancient, but retold over and over anew. And um, another poem called Witch's Pits. And this is from back east, one of the old Victorian cemeteries we had in New York State, Mount Hope Cemetery. And uh, this kind of was taken, at least the idea from the old cemetery. Witch's Pits. In a forgotten cemetery back east, there are deep pools of unmoving water Locals call witches' pits. Legends say that women accused of witchcraft were buried at the bottom, broken-limbed but alive as water poured in, covering guilt or innocence with blue-green still water, disturbed by an occasional ripple. Your eyes are witches' pits, deep, still, blue-green. If I look into them too long, I am dragged deeper into desire than I sometimes believe I can climb out of. I struggle against unsolicited wetness that envelops me, but I fall, a body seeking a ripple from your touch, my guilt or innocence buried in the deep still pools of your eyes. And I'm going to um, read one called Love in Late Afternoon. And I, I met my husband when I was uh, 49, almost 50. And there's something to be said for falling in love um, in a later stage of your life. And uh, this is called Love in Late Afternoon. We lie atop the fresh bed linen. The ceiling fan laps the air, love in late afternoon. French doors draped with lace curtains, half-masked with climbing roses above. Light from skylights, our bodies naked and imperfect, but working still so well. So delicious these afternoons without the tiredness of nightfall. Soon, dogs having finished treats will scratch at the door. The scent of the crockpot bubbles. The shower calls for two. Afternoons and ourselves well spent. And I'm going to uh, end with this poem. Called uh, Patterns. The winter night grieves for daytime sun. Through high-pitched moans, it calls fallen leaves to revelry, herding them in crisp circles towards the eye of howling wind, cold with a moist center. Winter night rattles window panes, shaking wood frames to enter, not flee confines of man-made shelter. Stroking storm glass in balmy disguise by day, panting at the door, waiting for sundown invitation. Winter moon hangs like an ornament forgotten on a hidden evergreen bough. The crystal night air lacquers the walk with a misty aerosol of dampness. It is the time to open the window a crack, tame the wind to stir the soup pot, Caress rounded contours of velvet and rock the cradle till morning. Thank you. 
And our next reader will be John Wessick, who comes to us from Boston. Thanks, Diane. Um, sorry about the video. I can't get my camera to work. I'm going to start out uh, with a short story that I wrote to cash in on the superhero craze. It's called Middle Class Man. No one knew what the meeting was about, not the employees sitting on folding chairs 10 columns wide by 12 deep, nor Donna from HR who'd set the chairs out. Despite her colorful scarf, the scene in the warehouse was drab. Concrete floors, cinder block walls, and a lonely podium made of the same gray metal as the doors. Punctual as always, CEO Derek Chainsaw McIntyre started the meeting precisely at 8.30. He had red hair, pockmarked skin that always seem sunburned and a neatly groomed mustache. His body was trim and fit as only those of people who spend hours at the gym are, although anyone who knew him would doubt he enjoyed the exercise. I won't beat around the bush. The microphone squealed with feedback and McIntyre turned it slightly. Is that better? As you know, business hasn't been good for several years. Back at corporate, we've decided, we've examined the numbers and just can't keep going this way. We've decided to close the plant. The audience erupted with murmurs. Hold on, McIntyre held up a hand for silence. In recognition of your loyalty, the board is going to provide each of you one week's pay for every year you've worked as severance. A crash came from overhead, and broken glass clattered on the floor. Heads rose to see a man with a chin the size of a bulldozer repel from the broken skylight. Despite his flashy entrance, he dressed in business casual khakis and a polo shirt monogrammed with an M. Seconds after touchdown, he released the nylon climbing rope, dashed to the microphone, and grabbed the CEO in a headlock. I am middle class man, here to single-handedly battle the systemic problems contributing to the economic decline of the American middle class. You'd better hire all these workers back or you're going to get it. Going to get what, McIntyre asked. I'm going to give you noogies so severe that you'll need a bigger hat size. Middle class man moved his giant fist toward McIntyre's scalp. It's McIntyre struggled in middle class man's grip. It's all the federal regulations that are killing us. I can't hire them back unless you get OSHA and the EPA off my back. EPA, huh? Middle class man, let McIntyre go. Very well, I'll take care of it. Flanked by aides lugging briefcases and laptop computers, EPA Administrator Katie Barstaff exited the House Rayburn office building onto Independence Avenue to wait for her limo. After a frustrating meeting with the congressman from West Virginia, all she wanted was to return to her office, take off her heels, and pour herself a big glass of the Kentucky bourbon she kept in the bottom drawer of her desk. A lavender SUV cut across two lanes of traffic and screeched to a halt in front of her. Shocked by the driver's recklessness, Administrator Bar staff didn't realize the danger until it was too late. Before she knew it, a man in a polo shirt got out, knocked down her aides, and grabbed her in a headlock. Within seconds, she was prisoner in the back seat of the SUV as it sped away. Stranger still, a gorilla was driving. Who are you? I'm a middle class man, here to single handedly battle the systemic problems contributing to the economic decline of the American middle class. All right, who's the monkey? That's Num Chomsky. I liberated him from the Yerkes Primate Research Center after some psychologists taught him to speak using American Sign Language. As if on cue, Chomsky grunted and gestured. 
What's he saying? He says the I-95 is backed up and that he wants a banana. But I didn't come here to talk about language acquisition in primates. Middle class man held up his fist. If you don't eliminate your job killing regulations, I'm going to give you such a powerful set of noogies that you'll regret it. Derek Chainsaw McIntyre was late. Middle class man stood outside the corporate headquarters looking at a parking lot that was empty except for a BMW and a green skinned man digging holes in the asphalt with a jackhammer. Middle class man checked his watch. It was 630. With nothing better to do, he watched the man work. After completing each hole, the green man planted a sapling, added potting soil, and sprinkled it with water. Then he began digging another hole in a seemingly random spot. Around seven, McIntyre emerged from the office. Mr. McIntyre, sir, middle class man took a deep breath. Just smell that sulfur dioxide. As you can tell, I took care of the EPA. Now, how about reopening the factory and hiring back those laid off workers? We should get help, but I can't compete with all that cheap labor in China. McIntyre took out his keys and walked to his BMW. China, huh? I'll take care of it. As he was leaving, middle class man asked the green man, who are you? I'm global warming man, here to single-handedly put out an end to climate change. Security at the Chinese Communist Party's head compound at Junan High was among the best in the world. Guards chosen from the People's Liberation Army's elite October 1st Division patrolled the perimeter and no expense was spared equipping the facility with advanced electronic surveillance. However, all this manpower and technology was no match for a man armed with American know-how and a pair of craftsmen wire cutters from Sears. After his kidnapping, Chinese leader Hu Jintao woke to find his wrist secured to the metal chair he sat on. He screamed for help. Yell all you want to, Hu Jintao. Middle class man stepped out of the shadows. No one can hear you. Who are you? Hu Jintao rotated his head and rolled his shoulders to loosen the muscles in his sore neck. I'm middle class man, here to single-handedly battle the systemic problems contributing to the economic decline of the American middle class. What do you want from me? What do I want? Middle class man stepped behind the Chinese leader, wrapped a forearm around his neck, and vigorously rubbed his scalp with the knuckles of his free hand. Don't play games with me, Hu Jintao. Stop keeping your currency artificially low. Raise your wages and environmental standards to U.S. levels and start enforcing copyright protections or else you'll be sorry. You're you're asking me to commit economic suicide. If I did that, all our jobs would go to Vietnam or Burma. Burma, huh? I'll take care of it. For anyone who's penetrated security at June on high, breaking into a Russian missile silo is a snap, as two officers of the strategic rocket forces found on returning to the control room after their morning vodka and caviar break. Both were quickly subdued with powerful headlocks and then handcuffed by a man in a polo shirt and a silverback gorilla. Let's see. Middle class man examined the control panel and began turning dials. Here we go. 16 degrees, 48 minutes north, 90 degrees, 9 minutes east. Who's the monkey? A Russian asked. That's Num Chumsky. He speaks sign language. The gorilla grunted and gestured. What's he saying? He's asking whether it's pronounced Rangoon or Yangon, and he wants a banana. Chumsky made more gestures. Now he says 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, liftoff. Middle class man punched a red button and the control room shook as the ICBM went on its way. On his second visit to Jung Nan Hai, middle class man found Hu Jintao peeking out of the turret hatch of a T-99 battle tank instead of the usual suit and tie. The Chinese leader was wearing a leather helmet and olive drab fatigues. 
hey, Hu Jintao, I took care of Burma. Now how about raising those Chinese wages? Screw you, Yankee middle class man. We like our economy the way it is. Motors whirred as the turret turned and the tank's 125 millimeter cannon lowered to point directly at middle class man. Fire, yelled Hu Jintao. Fortunately for middle class man, his Eddie Bauer Kevlar polo shirt protected him from the blast. After the debacle at Jung Nun High, he retreated to his secret lair in Muncie, Indiana to plan a new economic strategy. We need to find something we can sell to the Chinese, middle class man, said a bowl of microwave popcorn on the table in front of Num Chomsky. Chomsky stood, pointed at the world map and gestured. What's that, Chomsky? Sell them opium? That's a splendid idea. I wonder why no one has ever thought of that before. In a greenhouse the size of a football field, workers in polo shirts scurried about, examining poppies for signs of insects and disease, checking mineral levels and hydroponic fluid, and repairing electronic equipment. Quite an impressive operation you have here, Global Warming Man said. And we're well on our way to becoming carbon neutral, middle class man pointed to the roof. During the day, solar cells power the pumps and charge the batteries they run off at night. What are you growing anyway? We're growing opium to sell to China, middle class man crossed his arms over his chest in satisfaction. But that's illegal. It can't be illegal. It's all natural. If the DEA catches me again, they'll put me away for 30 years. Global warming man dashed toward the exit. Damn government bureaucrats. Middle class man raised his arms over his head and waved. Attention, everyone, gather round. The workers formed a circle. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to lay you off. The workers dropped their tools and started toward the door. And I'm going to need your polo shorts back, middle class man added. Chomsky, the gorilla, stood from the computer control station and rested a hand on his mentor's shoulder. I'm afraid that means you too, Chomsky. The gorilla hung his head. Try to think of the bright side, middle class man said. It's the creative destruction that's the engine of American competitiveness. Chomsky gestured. Of course you can use me as a reference. The gorilla began removing his shirt. Ah, what the hell? You can keep the shirt. With nothing better to do, middle class man went to the park and watched a pickup basketball game. As always, his sympathy was with the underdog, so instead of concentrating on the dribbles, dunks, and fast breaks, he paid attention to a man in a yellow jersey sitting on the sidelines. Why aren't you playing? middle class man asked. Bad needs. Doctor says I need surgery, but I don't have health insurance. Knee surgery, huh? Middle class man grabbed the injured man in a headlock and using the pressure of his forearm against the carotid artery quickly rendered him unconsciousness. Seeing the scuffle, the basketball players surrounded them. What are you waiting for? Can't you see he needs knee surgery? You, middle class man pointed at a bald man wearing a headband. Bring me some rubbing alcohol and a kitchen knife. Okay, looks like I got two minutes left. Let me just do one other poem and we'll call it quits. This is a little poem called Crime Wave. I don't know about murder hornets, but cockroaches loiter in my cupboards and drunk and disorderly geese honk to hip hop music until dawn. But you know what they say, when Canada sends its waterfowl, they don't send their best. They send hooligans, delinquents, and scoflaws smuggling maple syrup and back bacon in their beaks. Law enforcement is a joke. Cops look the other way when coyotes shoplift beef jerky from the 7-Eleven. They even let the black bear who broke into my kitchen off with a warning. Otters or longhorn beetles must be paying them off. When I discovered a blue jay was using my credit card number to buy 50 pound sacks of birdseed online, I didn't bother reporting it. I blame the media. With all the lewdness on those PBS nature documentaries, is it any wonder that gangs of white-tailed deer shake down business owners and woodchucks sell crack cocaine by Mrs. Blumtrapster's petunias? Hell, the only reason the feds locked up that bighorn sheep was for tax evasion. Thank God the murder hornets haven't made it here yet. <laughs>
The manslaughter spiders and assault and battery weevils are bad enough. Why, just last week there was a home invasion of carpenter ants, all with their little saws and hammers at the Dundersteads place. I've taken to keeping my shotgun loaded and propped by the door. If any mallard sparrows or nuthatches want to mess with me or mine, I'll be ready. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, am I on? Am I ready to go? Or do I await some introduction from Diane? All right, I guess I'm on. Thank you, Shante. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you, Diana. Just uh, very nice, John. I'm going to read a few poems. I must say, just at the top, is sort of aesthetically, I consider myself a lyric poet, which doesn't mean anything old fashioned, but uh, it means music matters, not necessarily traditional. And I will say that I like thought in poetry, and I've written quite a few that are harder to get on one hearing aloud. So I'm not, I'm going to tend to read ones that foreground my voice, but generally it isn't meant to be a confessional voice it's an element in the poem an element of the music and thought music of the poem so i consider these sort of voice performances tonal bits as a lyric poet i'm happy that everything counts the lineation the space on the page the blank space the pauses and some of my colleagues here in an interview in an audience who write lyric poetry know what i'm talking about so and no further ado as they say I will read something right now as I move to open up my poems. Uh, this is a little poem. I'm mostly going to read pretty recent stuff. I write a lot. I've published a lot, but believe me, I've been rejected many more times. Uh, and uh, I like anything that gets taken as a surprise and delight. So I'm about to read a little introduction poem for those who have the flutter butterflies in your gut before you go on in front of a live audience or maybe a audience on Zoom. This is called My TED Talk. Rest assured, I never gave one and never will be asked to. My TED Talk, 18 minutes to justify my life, my clothes, my degrees, my exes, their exes, my taste in music, my wine club and local poetry group, my secret thoughts and dreams. The atmospherics aren't good, someone whispers just before I go on stage. The numbered index cards bunched in my fist like fluttering butterflies plucked out of the air to save or to kill. I knew it would come to this. I walk to the center of the waiting eyes of teachers, friends, eager critics who are neither enemies and imaginary lovers, unsteady as a captain in an Arctic storm, a salmon fishing boat in the Bering Strait, pitching and yawing before it collapses entirely into wings of wind and ice and disappears. Sometimes you hope for that. I happen to love uh, film noir and privileged to teach it for 10 years or more, especially Hitchcock. So I've got I put three, I write generally small poems, but I write, took three of them, put them together in a little sequence for an anthology on film that's coming out. So I just decided to read this one. It's called At the Kit Kat Club. And you might get that that's a reference to the club in uh, the uh, famous movie, whose uh, cabaret. And in fact, it's what the theater got to be known as that showed the cabaret play. And there was a Kit Kat club kind of notorious in uh, Berlin and in New York for years. So what I'm doing here is kind of doing three little poems that shift point of view and involve you as the audience. <clears throat> At the Kit Kat club, the epigraph is, I won't because all of me wants to. 
great line from Humphrey Bogart, Sam Spade in the great, the Maltese Falcon third version of that film. And uh, it's an essence for me of and one idea of American, of masculinity, absolute self-denial, even denying love. Maybe you love me, maybe you don't. He tells her at the end when he sends her over. If you don't know the film, you don't know that. First one I call noir to get the essence, noir. If there'd been more light, maybe he would have seen it coming, but he took the blow to the back of his head and fell forward, limp as a ventriloquist dummy sprawled on the table where they found him, blood spattered, mumbling that she was here just a second ago or maybe an hour. He's lost track of time from the minute he entered. And the music is loud, so he never heard what the others were saying at the tables around him. They all seemed to be watching but nobody warned him as she sat down and leaned close enough to breathe in his ear while she poured a dream in his drink that lingered the way nightmares do when the fear that conjures them is your own desire and your head swims and your nerves are on fire. Two is simply called Dick. Dick, Seamus, any of the names for private I, so I call it Dick for good reason. And this one is his point of view. The thing you grab onto, the way a guy grabs a blonde in a tough guy movie is the thing that will kill you. Full of farce and threat that laces your nerves tight. He says, come here, leans her back and kisses her satin mouth, smooth as her stockings, despite the looks of the patrons who include some tough guys for sure, maybe the boss whose girl she is. Can he survive their assassinations, greed, the purple wound, the whole world's rottenness? You were hoping he would survive the blonde, survive even himself. And the third part, blonde. The Joe who kissed me in the smoky room, full of what he thought were strangers, was another fool. I could have been a hat check chick. I could have been Delilah. He thought it was his idea to kiss me. What did you know, tough guy? What do you think you did? The boss was watching, as he always is. It was easy to tempt you with lipstick and smoke. It was easy to make you the joker, the mark. Who pulls the strings? And why does it matter? A lamb to a slaughter. Isn't that what they say? Maybe we all are, maybe all of the time. What's typical there is I go beyond, I'm saying more than it's saying, I hope. Little poem that just came today, right before this event. Uh, I picked, took it out of the mail, so it's just been published in uh, Into the Void, that interesting Canadian journal. Touch, touch. Sometimes you're shaving and the touch of the blade on the skin of your neck becomes more than habit, becomes an irresistible urge. This morning, for example, I watch myself in the mirror, fingers pulling the aging skin as if picking a penny from a sidewalk. And I feel him again, the dark priest in the mirror. All the mistakes, the stuff you don't want to remember, that just looking at your own face brings back. They say crows have been proven to have a greater intelligence than we do. They seem to thrive on remembering everything. Every face of anyone who helped them, the ones who hurt them or even intended hurt. This must be useful to survival. Like the eloquent grating sounds that are their language. To me, their syllables are the raspings of a saw, like bad memories. What are they saying about me, standing in front of my mirror, holding this razor, its cool, metallic touch? You're not getting, of course, the line organization, but everything's organized. Uh, I'm going to take a little risk here and stretch the voice. This is my one uh, virus poem. I had to inevitably write, and it's a strange poem, I think, 
the voice works through numerous changes of nuance and attitude and mood in one short, relatively short poem, one page. So I hope it'll give you some pleasure to follow. After another virus death. Good one, God. Choking on your own phlegm? I don't think I would have thought of it. And you'd better believe I'm no slouch at thinking up ways for my enemies to die. Those who deserve to die and those who, if I'm honest, don't. Ex-lovers, rivals, anyone who hurt me, and some who just pissed me off. Mood matters. Evidently, though, not to God, who's pretty calm about leveling entire cities, considering he's supposedly motivated by anger when he does. He's phlegmatic, you might say, if you have a dark sense of humor and a darker sense of fate. Humor is subjective, but how else to look at fate? We all lose in the end, we know. And we didn't, uh, we all, we didn't choose to enter the casino we woke up in with a life past to gambling on happiness. You could say we're on an extended losing streak and some never escape. But for most, it comes in stages. Things can look good for a while, like sun streaking a street after rain. And there are those who love the rain and some who love the storms they never knew they could outlast. Solo navigating at sea in a small craft they designed and built themselves. Sailing their own ship, so to speak. Crossing high swells with brave intent as if they are the heroes of their lives. It must be fun to touch the other shore after crossing like that. Rain or shine, worth the trip. That blessed hour. Give me a little pause. Here's a poem called Evading Hitler, which has my own idea of a positive ending, evading Hitler. The way I do it is to fold my family into a space as small as my breath and hold them inside my body, in the warm pouch of my belly, in the cold pockets of my lungs, as we leave together in the thinnest hour of the night when nobody's watching, or if they are, they can't see us pass silently as shadows down the secret alleys where you can escape history by becoming invisible. Yet your loved ones remain intact like jewels in an intricate setting. There's no need to worry so long as I keep running down the unlit alleys where there's nothing to stop me except the rats and the bodies we leap over as easily as the moonlight sweeping my hair so it almost seems we're flying. And now I'm down near the end, so I'm going to end, thank you for the cue, with very short poems that are not untypical of me. Glass, two stanzas of six lines each. Glass, everything slips away from me. A noise in a dark room I can almost hear, a flicker of light behind a window I can't reach through. I can't reach through time because it is glass, glass, impermeable, and no one can reach into shadows. I have a friend who's dying now, and when he dies, he would be amazed to see the affection he didn't think he had from people like me and closer, who knew him well enough to know some hearts need to hide in shadows. Eavesdropping on my own funeral eavesdropping at my funeral is what it's called. Thank God he's gone, one says. I won't miss him, another adds. Who did the son of a bitch think he was? Begins a clamor of distinct voices no one can hear. He beat us around so bad we could never please him. And to top it, he leaves us on our own as if that helps anything. And these are my poems, and I know they mean it. And I'll conclude with mountain irises with my last minute. 
a, a poem about spring we all devoutly hope for. Even the Californians probably are waiting for it for my late wife, Judith. Mountain irises. Incarnation is messy, but spring takes the cake. Wake with a pain in your belly, head stuffed with pollen. Feel warm sun spurt through your arms and legs like a juice that just makes you thirstier. Then there's the cost of trying to ignore the call flesh makes on spirit. You promise yourself this time to resist the sweetness of fresh cream, the silk tongue of chocolate, the pull of another skin on your skin. This sun, this sun, take in these flowers whose color winces the naked eye, blue, deep blue, the symbolism of heaven. Love what dies. Thank you, everyone who helped make this happen. Anybody listening? Hi, everybody. Um, hello this evening from the beautiful, bountiful California desert near Palm Springs. Weather is beautiful, 70 degrees, and this is our turn for great weather after it's 125 degrees in the summer, which I'm not exaggerating. Toktamoni, Tony Shell. I unbraid horsehair from the bit, uncinch the saddle while I go inside Main Street Boardwalk. I am man's feet. I learn to speak in forked tongue, mastering lies. Hidden mother load. I am women's prize eyes. Tighten my grip on the shot glass, the tarnished concubines. Strolling in for the night, eyeing me. They see what the Christian women don't. Eyelet to ribbon to lace. A certain side saddle deceit. It's in this town, I'll turn things around. Gallop on the blue stallion to where the sun lies down. On bones midstream, changing its font from mountain to desert. No water here, just a sister whiskey blur. I'll knot the rope a little tire. tighter. Tighter, remember the recipe for arsenic dreams. Nod your silent consent. Um, I used to work as a wildland firefighter across the California desert and western U.S. And so I have a few fire poems for you. Firestorm, Southern California. It's the time of year that we have fire weather. When the air cracks with every bite. When the cool ocean breezes stop their teas. The heart of summer. This is brute heat. Today, true to form, a fire breaks out on a distant rise. I watch the white hot clouds bubble into the sky. Taste black ash that reminds me of my firefighting days. Hiking with the men on rugged flanks. Sidestepping an angry rattlesnake or two. Boots crunching another crispy critter or three, as we call them and the weak attempt we make to gouge a fire line into the hillside in advance of the raging flames. Many times I would lean into my fresh sharpened shovel, just praying for a shift in wind, a drop of rain. Mopping up. It's the most unraveled and well-paying job I've had fighting fires in far-flung lonely wilderness areas, all the way from the San Bernardino National Forest to the Panamint Mountains near Death Valley, the Southern Sierra in Yosemite, the Trinity Alps, the San Gabriels looming above LA like broken teeth. Most of the time, I was the only girl on the fire crew, cutting fire lines, sucking down smoke. And after a fire had laid down across ravaged meadows, and once forested slopes, our job was far from done. We hiked in big potato hot ankle deep ash that blew eerily in the wind like shed snakeskins to finish off dying wildfires by stirring and cooling the molten detritus with shovels, convict crews working with us side by side. 
We spray dribbles of water from the fat bags. It sloshed like heavy vertigo on our backs. We called them piss pumps. We struggled to keep pace in the slowed down underbelly of burned up things in cherished if little known Golden State geographies with lonely names. Rattlesnake Mountain, Horse Thief Spring, Last Chance Range, Toro Peak. Above us, the whispered remains of once familiar forest trees, lurking black and tall and jagged, stripped of the dignity of their given names. Jeffrey Pine, Ponderosa, Western Sequoia, California Black Oak, no more. And at our feet, the complete bequeathing of the latter fuels. Manzanita, Western Juniper, Coyote Brush, Poison Oak, whispering away to be no more. Still, we could never be sure a wildfire was completely out. So we kept stirring ash, sifting through what had been scorched and watched each unearthed ember spark hot and red, then whoosh into its desperate last breath. So this is what I remember the most vividly from my firefighting days, the mopping up, making sure the fire was always put to bed soothing the feverish brow or forsaken landscapes to cool them down. That and how often the guys on the crew, including my future daughter's father, ask me why I'd left behind the apron of my domesticity to flirt with flames instead of with them. Barely there. 27 Februarys ago with a case of Budweiser, I hiked all the way to the top of East Ord Mountain in the Mojave Desert with three guys from the fire crew. Kevin, who made a million dollars growing marijuana illegally in a hydroponic greenhouse. Tom, my boyfriend, who is strictly vegetarian and liked to take apart Volkswagens. Vince, a Native American often mistaken for Italian, the future father of my daughter. All day in a jagged landscape lacking trails to the top of that lonely 6,000 foot high peak. We took turns firing Vince's AK-47 at rock outcrops. I won't lie, shooting that rifle was a lot of fun. And near the mountaintop, we found a charred pair of bighorn sheep horns resting inside a cave. They looked really old, probably burned from some old fire that swept through here, we said. Just some old sheep that died up here. Years later, a Chamwevi elder tells me this. Those horns were left there as an offering by a shaman. He cried for us all. He touched the stars. Women of the Desert. From Timbisha Shoshone tribal leader Paulina Steve's homeland statement to Congress in 2000. We are people of the desert. We have been here since time began. This valley, which we call Tapa'a, is our place of life, a place of renewal. Their name for this place, Death Valley, is unfortunate. We live as one with the valleys, mountains, flats, meadows, and springs. All of the springs are interconnected across the desert beneath the ground. We have been the keepers of these springs for centuries. We saw those lost people in the wagon train from the Manly Party in 1849. They refused to speak with our women. We could have helped them survive. All they had to do was ask us where the water was. And here's my last poem called Teaching My Daughter to Put Out Fire. It isn't your typical scenario. A young mother who worked seven years ago as a wildland firefighter driving a Jeep in four-wheel drive up 3 and 14, the back road to Big Bear from Victorville, with her daughter, just five years old, to reach the rattlesnake fire burn zone, the last fire she ever fought before becoming a mom. This is just another July day. The mother wants to see for herself how the mangled landscape looks today. What remains, if anything, of the Joshua and Pinion trees what bird sounds possibly filter now through the barren air? What reference points to negotiate by, if anything, without the Jeffrey Pines or Live Oak, without the Juniper? And she worked on this fire. She watched it burn away. Huge boulders scatter revealed. 
ominous ghost wails rising from heavy smoke. She wants to reassess, look for signs of life, tell her daughter everything about this story. Now that so much has been taken away, a careless toss of a cigarette, a careless finger on a trigger, a father locked away, his best friend dead. Some things appear to have been destroyed forever. Some things are new. Some things seem to have been saved. Some things new and strange grow in this very transformed space. What will, what will there be? Ravens, a few Western Jay? Will there be mountain wildflowers suckling the darkened sky and dirt? Perhaps a few brave deer negotiating their way across a moonscape on their way to a small choked spring. Jackrabbits hopping tentatively in and out of the slowly dying or maybe regenerating Joshua trees. And before they reach the lonely place, they stop at the empty campground so the daughter can run and play. Her daughter spots it first, a wisp of smoke tickled by light wind and rising, a careless camper, a campfire not put out. So the mother reaches for her army shovel and hands her daughter a bottle of water. We have work to do, she says. This is how you put out a fire. It's not too young to learn, might as well do it now. Let's put out this fire before it has a chance to grow and burn things down. We will look for the small things, a wisp of sexy smoke, a gleam of orange eyes, a seduction of tiny flame. This is where it starts and this is where it will stop. Nothing more will burn here today, never mind how pretty it seems. Um, I think I have a little time left, but um, I could read something else if you guys want. I guess I'll read one more poem. It's always good to be short on time and not go over your time. Ghost Flower, Mojavea Confortiflora. For Mary Beale, mid 20th century botanist in the Mojave. Shivering by day, glowing at night, blooming only in March and April, this flower marked by splotches of red in its white heart, attracting lovers through mimicry, not producing nectar, named by a botanist who worked alone in the deep Mojave to render it bold in her drawings, in her voice, in her heart. This small flower speaks with a lisp on the rocky lips of forsaken canyons, flourishing where no woman should go. But there it is, forever hard to find unless you tiptoe by. And that's it, thanks. And there you have it, our February installation of Poetry Square. And I want to thank my uh, fellow poets, um, Stan, John, and Ruth, and the enjoyable evening that they gave us. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month, where we'll have uh, three current Californian poets. We'll have uh, Sarah Okte, and we'll have Diana Medina and Roger Funston. So see everyone next month, and thank you for joining us. Good night, everyone.